is another edition of 3D Printing News on Build, courtesy of 3dprint.com. And today we're going to start our 3D printing news with BioHome 3D. Uh, this is a 3D printed house made, or the, of which the structure is made entirely of bio-based materials. Um, this was developed uh, thanks to the U.S. Department of Energy's Hub and Spoke program, University of Maine, or Maine worked on it, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and also Maine Housing and Maine, the Maine Technology Institute. This is a, a 55 square meter um, home with has 3D printed floors, walls, and a roof. Uh, and also the insulation material is, is also made of hundred percent wood, uh, type of material. The entire construction is made of different, uh, bio-based materials, which are in additionally also recyclable, uh, biofibers, fiber reinforced and bioresins. The idea is end of life, this entire home, or I guess, uh, except for the fittings and the windows could be recycled. Um, this kind of thing, it's easy to see how governments could really, really get behind this kind of thing, especially if we're looking at uh, that there may be as much as 7 million affordable housing units needed across the United States of America. There's this thing about this affordable housing crisis or a housing crisis, as Michael, our editor-in-chief, pointed out earlier in some articles about dehyping this 3 printed housing boom. We aren't a catch-all solution for, for these houses. Oftentimes, it's affordability because incomes have lagged and incomes have not gone up in, in, in line with inflation, stuff like this. It doesn't have to necessarily mean that, that, that 3D printing is a solution. But imagine we could just be a solution of some of these 7 million homes. Imagine developers found out a way to build them first, get them financed, and then rent them out to people, for example. Um, this could be a very, very lucrative and very, very good, uh, generally, for people uh, kind of thing to do. So that's a wonderful business then. And this is uh, the picture you see of this uh, house. So this is something that ha could have a lot of legs. Uh, the next thing is manufacturing. Finnish company manufacturing makes a very... Uh, uh, precise um, ultra-high temperature printers or high-temperature 3D printers. So think of chamber uh, temperatures above 250, uh, extruder temperatures above 400 C, um, you know, printers that are capable of printing PEC and PEAK and uh, filled versions of these materials. Now, what they've done is they've made a new version of the uh, Mini Factory Ultra 2. This has more sensors in the build chamber. It's very important. It allows them to control build chamber temperature a lot because that's a problem with peak, for example. It's very difficult to print if you have a lot of heat bleed in this uh, build chamber. It also has improved airflow uh, across the build chamber, uh, which is, uh, again, another um, crucial element controlling how this part, uh, the polymer crystallizes, how this part is built. Uh, generally, it's a it's kind of an improvement on the existing, the existing ultra printer with better quality assurance, better parts, uh, higher details, higher smoothness. And they also have Arnie, which is like a, uh, a software that will uh, allow them to increase the traceability, repeatability of their parts. Uh, again, an incremental improvement, but a very, very incremental one, which doubles build speed as well. But generally, I think what people are really looking for is this quality assurance kind of improvements where there's incre better traceability with better logging of who printed what, with what geometry and what file, what moment, and what orientation, what temperature, that kind of thing. And that's going to really make a difference in the places where these uh, peak and uh, peak related materials are being used like PEC and aerospace and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, medical and other kind of, uh, you know, uh, areas where, you know, they're very critical applications. Uh, the other uh, news today is from Trias Tech. Uh, Trias Tech it has a melt extrusion deposition technology, which you can see uh, diagrammed in front of you. And that uh, technology has uh, entered into an IND or an investigational new drug application for, uh, with the FDA, uh, the US FDA. Now, this melt extrusion deposition uh, uh, process is essentially it's a GMP compliant or CGMP compliant process that uh, means that you don't have to first make a filament, but you print directly the, the capsule material or the drug itself. Uh, in this process. Uh, so the patent is, uh, I would describe it as a very, very nice one to have. And now the team is moving ahead with uh, clinical trials, clinical studies for the T21. Uh, the T21 is their drug uh, that is meant to potentially treat ulcerative colitis. Um, and what they've done here is a very, really smart thing. Uh, what they've done is essentially what happens nowadays is, well, because it's difficult to deliver drugs to the colon exactly where we kind of need them, they kind of flood the colon with this medicine. Now, that is, of course, not great for the patient. And the, the, what Triastec is doing is trying to find a much more kind of precision way of deploying this medicine where it needs to go. Um, so instead of overflow, overloading the system with enough medicine so that 
eventually some will get deep down in the column where it needs to be. What they've done is they've done uh, radiography to try and measure where these capsules dissolve in patients. And then they'll find out where exactly, what geometry of the 3D printed capsule will dissolve at what point in the colon. This allows them to get less medicine and get it to dissolve at exactly the right uh, uh, place in the colon, which could potentially, by the way, be personalizable, but of course could just help you penetrate this colon a little better at the right place, generally to be a more effective medicine for the small molecules to deliver these small molecule uh, at the, the right place. This is, of course, much better for the patients. Precision medicine is thought to be always better. Um, you have less side effects, less uh, other problems for the medicine that cause other problems, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, generally, this is an approach which we could see replicated across a lot of drugs. Indeed, the companies work on T19 and T20. One of them is a rheumatoid arthritis product, and the other one is a clotting product. They also have a, co uh, a collaborative agreement with Eli Lilly and company. And yeah, Triasec Chinese firm, by the way, really leading the world in this. And uh, I think Spiritum is, okay, is ahead of them as in they already have approval for the medicine. But um, uh, one of the leading firms is this Triastec firm that is really doing uh, some really cutting edge work. And, and it's easy to see how they can apply these different dosage forms, these different geometries, the different release kinetics to lots and lots of different things. And by commercializing and licensing their own technology, this could be a very, very valuable uh, IP stack indeed. Um, the next thing uh, is that we are looking at another medical thing, that is Zimmer Biomet. So Zimmer Biomet, early 3D printing pioneer, has just received FDA 510K clearance for the uh, Persona Osseo T Keel Tibia. Uh, this is part of the Persona Knee system. It's an entire platform of these things. It's a cementless total knee replacement. Uh, and it replaces an earlier product with a more porous uh, product. This porous porosity is based on the Biomet Osseo T uh, kind of geometry or family of geometries which is meant to uh, mimic uh, human uh, cancerous bone. The idea is that uh, this geometry allows for four-week integration, better cell migration, better cell vascularization, and better boning growth. Um, we can see a lot of stuff going on with these 5 out of 10K uh, clearances for specifically TI-64, TI-64 variant, um, also integration, also uh, conductive uh, kind of implants, uh, especially for knee and also hip. Uh, but also for all sorts of different systems. So this, this area is really, really booming. And what we can see is that a company can spend a lot of time making a geometry, which again, they could protect the IP of. Then they can just farm that geometry out, if you will, to different systems across the body or tweak it to for cancerous bone or other types of bone or cartilage or whatever. And then uh, and then launch many implants or a whole implant family based on that. So it's, it's a very lucrative approach. And and, you know, if you're looking at buy to fly, if you're looking at being able to, for example, you know, make an implant a little bit less stiff to, to reduce stress shearing, we're seeing that this characteristics and the economic characteristics of, of, of 3D printing these kind of things is um, very lucrative indeed. So, so we would expect this kind of uh, orthopedic success in titanium and these novel geometries to, to expand and also think about being able to protect these geometries. Think about Zimmer Biomet, for example, all of a sudden figure out that for cancerous bone, they're also tight TI or also tie uh, geometry, maybe the best one, right? Imagine that kind of advantage that would give them uh, in the market. So uh, I really believe that uh, this is a, a, an area that's going to get even bigger than it is now, even though we're seeing a lot of economic activity. So thank you guys for listening. This is your, uh, my name is Joris Peels, and this is another uh, version of 3D printing news on Peel. Thanks to 3dprint.com. Uh, thanks a bunch for 